Um, okay, that's perfect. Um, so thanks very much for joining us wherever you are, whether it's uh, it's online or, or here at, at Queen's University Belfast. Uh, I'm delighted to uh, welcome this afternoon's speaker who's joining us uh, from Royal Holloway, University of London. Uh, and it's Dr. Shamima Akhtar, uh, who lectures in history at Royal Holloway. Um, she's a historian of race, migration uh, and empire, teaches on the history of the world's fairs in the 19th and the 20th centuries in both Britain and the US with a particular focus on the representation of Ireland. Uh, she's interested in constructions of whiteness, um, the intersections between display and the visual in identity making. And she takes a cultural approach to the study of history, uh, mapping the modes of knowledge production as it relates to the marginalized communities uh, of the British Empire. Um, so it's a great pleasure uh, to have uh, Shamima with us uh, today, who's going to talk about uh, her research um, on uh, the uh, uh, Columbian exhibition uh, in um, exposition, I should say, in Chicago in 1893. And the title of Shamima's, Shamima's talk uh, is Ireland on the Midway, the Chicago World's Fair of 1893. So, Shamima, I'm going to pass over to you. And there we are. Uh, yes. 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 Yeah. All right, um, thank you, uh, Peter, for, for inviting me. Um, what I'll talk about today is one of the chapters of um, my upcoming monograph, uh, which should be uh, due to be submitted late next year, so uh, probably possibly out the following year. So, heralding the United States as the land of our hope, uh, the Columbian Exposition held in Chicago in 1893 contained a cornucopia of both material objects and embodied displays from industrial treasures to arts and crafts, from emblems of mechanized progress to cultural artifacts and people, all celebrated aspects of the West were lauded in visual form. Visitor numbers reached enormous figures, so 27 million attended from its opening to the public on the 1st of May, 1893, to the 30th of October that same year. The Chicago Fair displayed the virtues and potentially transformative powers of civilization spanning 600 acres, demonstrating industry, architecture and culture. Crucially, an in-between space operated in the form of the midway plaisance, which acted as the visual and physical bridge between progress and development. OK, just bear with us for a second, folks. We're having a slight technical problem here. The slides are the best bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we need to get the slides working. OK, just bear with us. Um, let's, do, let's go back to the... What do you do from the current slide on the top? Yeah. OK, great. Okay. So um, as we can see on the screen, this is a view of the Midway Plaisance, which was a mile long 600 foot wide strip of land linking Washington Park to Jackson Park. Placed at the far end of the fairground, this midway acted as a barometer essentially, according to exhibition organizers, for the world's progress and development. Embodying a quote, a torch of civilization, it contained everything from a Japanese bazaar, a Havanese as well as a German village, a Brazilian concert hall, um, and an entire street in Cairo. It was completed by a Wild East show um, by the Ottomans' Arab camp and Sitting Bull's log cabin. So in this presentation, visitors could see the development of humanity, beginning with the white Irish and Germans closest to the fair's white city, and then descending according to perceived civilizational status away from this focal, focal point. So visitors were able to witness varying stages of mechanization, such as railway uh, systems, irrigation networks, and also military achievements. In this melange of the world's um, peoples, the Irish curiously featured twice for the affordable price of 25 cents. An Irish village, including Donegal Castle by Alice Hart, were situated alongside Lady Aberdeen's Irish industrial village and Blarney Castle, which is what I'll be talking about today. So fairs such as this um, had become common by the 19th century as grand spectacles that internationally showcased varied countries' arts, histories and communities for millions to consume. An important aspect of this exhibition in particular was the role played by these two women in formulating and executing the displays. 
Alice Hart, um, born in 1848, was an English woman committed to helping Donegal's poor, and she was the owner of the Irish village, including Donegal Castle. And Lady Ishbel Aberdeen, who was born in 1857, was an aristocratic Scottish woman famed for her charitable projects, um, and she was the owner of the Irish industrial village um, alongside Blarney Castle. So here we can see kind of two outsiders uh, to the Irish um, project per se, who were invested in um, financially and economically and kind of politically in, in, in displaying Ireland in this way. So both these women recognised that women's work often supplemented the male householder's income in times of extreme poverty. <clears throat> Labouring men typically partook in seasonal work, which was weather dependent and inevitably led to financial difficulties during winter. So concurrently, Hart and Aberdeen saw the solution as restoring traditional rural industries of spinning, sewing and weaving. In this context, um, exhibitions became important, uh, an important way to bolster sales, raise awareness, and most importantly, to create trade and profit for the destitute in Ireland through the bolstering of these industries. Now, differences in class between aristocratic and bourgeois spheres caused tensions uh, given Al Aberdeen's position in the inner circle of British rule and Hart's middle class status with the kind of less political prestige that afforded. They both recognised the advertising potential to stimulate trade. However, their ongoing hostilities meant that they could not work together. And so they organized separate exhibits in Chicago. And so that's why we have two visit, uh, villages. So even within the same rural revival movement, the two women's divergent class politics materialized in their distinctive creations of Irishness in Chicago. And how these two female philanthropists constructed distinct, distinct visions of Irish identity abroad um, amidst debates about home rule to ensure rural survival is uh, the subject of this paper. Aberdeen's and Hart's Irish villages were prominently part of an Irish subculture that thrived in the overseas communities, uh, particularly in the funding of the growing Irish independence movement, especially in the 1880s um, and from 1910 to 1922. Aberdeen held a more uh, moderate position within the broader home rule movement compared to Hart's um, politics, which has been described as more extreme, um, and both used the popular platform of display to champion their different um, Irish political agendas. So Lady Ishbel Aberdeen, um, we see um, on the PowerPoint, she was an aristocratic uh, Scot who served as vice regal consul in Canada from 1893 to 1898. She also enjoyed the political prestige from her husband John Aberdeen's appointment as Lord Lieutenant of Ireland in 1886 and again in 1906. Alice Hart was a middle class English woman uh, who dedicated her life to reversing the effect of poverty in the west of Ireland and helping, in her mind, prevent future famines. Both women wanted a home rule for Ireland in the form of a devolved union with Britain. However, Hart had more radical views than Aberdeen on Irish independence, um, as she believed England to be responsible for past Irish suffering. And she was quite vocal about this in, in, in lectures that she did throughout the country. So the two women existed within well-established uh, kind of tradition of local, national and international philanthropy in the 19th century. This was typically organised by gentry women who set up schools or offered instruction in peasants' cottages. These charitable concerns uh, for Aberdeen and Hart intersected with the <clears throat> terse political conditions of the time. Um, and Lady Aberdeen, in terms of her kind of charitable endeavours, she founded the Irish Industries Association in the late 1880s. Um, it aimed to, quote, uh, organise the home, cottage and other industries of Ireland and to bring the various centres of these industries into communication with one another." End quote. So the Irish Industries Association was the institutional <clears throat> body of the Royal Dublin Society, which triennially um, organised exhibitions in Ireland to stimulate agriculture and industry. It sought to facilitate arrangements whereby good designs may be brought within the reach of workers in all parts of Ireland, to <clears throat> find suitable markets uh, for Irish work, to promote the establishment of local centres and committees, and to offer advice um, to those who were producing these types of material, um, and ultimately to promote and advertise the use uh, the use of Irish goods, to collect donations to bolster the trade, um, and ultimately to make profitable again rural industries in Ireland for the benefit of the poor. Do you want to do the next slide? Just because it does. So 
So like Lady Aberdeen, um, Alice Hart identified rural crafts as vital to Irish modernity. She sought to revive the old cottage industries and to develop the ancient arts of spinning, weaving, knitting, sewing and embroidery in her own words. Amongst peasants by setting up the Donegal Industrial Fund um, after visiting the country in March 1883. She planned to build a network of technical schools in Donegal um, and uh, quote, find new markets for these goods, end quote. And a carefully devised system of village technical training, skilled in the making of homespuns of a kind and quality never before attempted in Ireland, was Hart's goal, which ultimately did not come to fruition, but she did establish some schools. Um, she set up a permanent depot for the sale of her industries at 43 Donegal House, Wigmore Street, London, where Kells embroideries, hand knit and hand woven hoisery and gloves, hand sewn under linen, lace, crochet, embroidered handkerchiefs and Irish linens could be purchased or ordered by post. Uh, Janice Helland, who is Hart's biographer, has neatly summarised that Hart's venture saw a cultural biography of Irish things to rescue a struggling island uh, which relied on the most familiar images of Irish land, people and object to encourage and sustain the consumption of Irish made products. So Aberdeen and Hart shared many similarities. Um, on the one hand, they both wanted to revive Irish industries and to demonstrate a so-called Irish ingenuity in the face of dominant negative prejudices about the country's underdevelopment um, that circulated in Britain at the time, the people's uh, supposed laziness and apathy and the waste of the land that um, was present in the 1890s. However, both were outsiders to the Irish project. They both understood the history of England's exploitation of Ireland, but they also succumbed to the reductive desire to romanticise the Irish folk and peasantry. For example, by 1880, 1 1.2 million of 1.8 million Irish uh, born migrants lived in the same states in the US, or 67% as a result of the famine exodus of earlier decades. And so the early 1890s provided for Aberdeen and Hart an ideal time for their exhibits, given that successive waves of Irish emigration continued unabated, um, increasing the num significant numbers of second and third generation Irish men and women who had previously settled in the US um, and were already keen to spend money on charity for their homeland. Irish men were often employed in skilled labour districts as mechanics, boilermakers, smiths, uh, fitters and Irish women were engaged in a variety of low paid professional occupations, including social work and nursing. And so cheap transportation and inexpensive tickets made the Chicago Fair accessible to these workers and not only for the middle, uh, middling and the elite of Irish, American and British society. On a dual level, the steady professionalisation and politicisation of the Irish immigrant class in Chicago created a further expansive um, community of Irish men and women to target for the exhibition project. Hart and Aberdeen relied on the financial and political support of largely Irish immigrants in the US. Um, and indeed, millions of Irish Americans participated enthusiastically in the fantasy of Ireland in the 1893 exhibition that celebrated Irishness abroad. Ishbal and um, Alice thereby profited, uh, capitalised on the readiness of America's Irish immigrant community to feel sympathy for their homeland and expend financially and financial and emotional labour to commit funds and sustain rural industry in an island they had left behind. So what became important for these visitors then was witnessing an Irish past and an Irish history rooted in rural industries and tradition. This reveals a type of Irish modernity um, that was imagined. Aberdeen's and Hart's conviction that a revival of rural industries would save Ireland put them at odds with most other countries in the 19th century, mm. uh, particularly those represented at the Chicago Fair, which typically uh, vied for increasing urban industrialization in the form of technical, uh, technological mechanization and modern architecture. These two women instead traded on a romanticized version of an Irish past that prioritized female labor as a source for good and a savior to the Irish nation. Clearly, an Irish modernity that was on the brink of industrialization became concomitant with saving Ireland um, for these elite women. And Ireland's potential for development through rural industries translated into hope for the country's future. So this uh, had the effect of reinforcing both the imperial networks that sustained Irish poverty, as well as the hierarchies within labor that reinforced unequal production and consumption. Despite this, the Irish American public enjoyed the tran tranquil Celtic island depicted on the fairground. 
Symbols were essential to convince Irish, American, British and international visitors of the vitality and prosperity of Ireland on the fairground. A visual politics emerged that targeted an Irish American audience designed to exploit their feelings of dislocation and engendered by migration centered on quaint Irish images of the land and people. These motifs thereby became integral to the process of setting, settling into a new overseas community, representing the transferable and then ultimately fluid boundaries of Irish symbolism. So recent and more established Irish migrants in the 19th century in the US could identify with the picturesque um, island they were seeing in the fairground that recreated their home country as a lost utopia, ready to be saved uh, from destitution. So by visiting the fairgrounds, uh, buying souvenirs and generally celebrating a forgotten rural island, enthusiastic participants in the Irish American project sustained the fiction of the fair. Aberdeen and Hart laboriously created authentic allegorical narratives of Ireland for mass consumption. And despite plans for the two of them to work together in a single Irish village in Chicago, the final display, of course, had two villages. And they fell out over the material conditions of their respective exhibits and their ideological justifications, as well as methods of improving the Irish condition. Disaffection between the two women was emphatically underscored by a competing difference in class within aristocratic and bourgeois spheres. For instance, Aberdeen exercised her power by seeking to influence the wealthy and the elite to sympathise with Ireland's plight. However, Hart's activism revolved around the high street and the encouragement of a popular mass market appeal of Irish goods amongst the rapidly growing middle class. Moreover, Aberdeen vehemently believed that the entrepreneurial capacity to promote Irish industry should continue unabated in the domestic and public sphere. She was an ardent advocate of Irish um, advertising Irish clothing and design uh, by wearing them herself. She frequently um, displayed Irish made clothing on herself and her family. She encouraged her peers to do the same. Um, and so she was regularly documented as performing this imagined Irishness in, in newspapers of the time. In contrast, uh, Hart had less involvement in the entertainment sphere and focused her attention on public lectures. She included in them striking photographs of poverty in Ireland taken during her short visits to the country um, and reaffirming constantly the connection between philanthropy and the visual in the rural revival project. In a sign of growing discourse, Hart in 1886 resisted merging the Donegal Industrial Front under the umbrella organization of the Irish Industries Association perhaps because it had a rigid, rigid bureaucratic structure composed mainly of lordly men and women. So consequently, a confrontation of sorts materializes between the two women in the archival records. A very polite, particular sort of disagreement is exposed. Um, Aberdeen and her husband were staunch supporters of a continued devolved union with Britain in the form of home rule. Um, and according to them, they admired the Irish character and praised Irish land and industry but Aberdeen still advocated for an English monarchy and arist um, aristocracy, um, aristocracy within the composition of 19th century society. However, Hart considered the English aristocracy uh, largely responsible for the ills of Ireland and vied against Lady Aberdeen's power and prestige. Their differences became visible to the public during this um, 1893 fair, where Aberdeen wrote that the idea of a village had first been evolved by Alice Hart, who you can see on the board, um, in connection with her uh, Donegal Industrial Fund, but we persuaded her that it would be better for all concerned if the I Irish Industries Association and the Donegal Industrial Fund combined for a joint effort, each taking shares um, of the expenses and profits. Nonetheless, according to Aberdeen's memoir, differences arose between the two sections and we just had to make the best of it. <coughs> so fair organisers granted her a separate commission for a second Irish village in a bid to boost profits, albeit on the same plot <coughs> and only a few metres away from Aberdeen's village with similar ambitions and materials on display. Specifically, Hart visually differed from Aberdeen with her interest in the Celtic Revival project, particularly embroidered Book of Kells motifs. Hart largely sought to resolve the imbalance of mechanised industry and proudly advertised genuine specimens of the work of the Irish people, namely Donegal peasant women. They perfected Kells embroidery designs worked in flax on flax that had popular appeal in England, Ireland and the US. In Hart believed that such self-acting and self-sustaining work would lead to the salvation of Ireland, and she employed up to 800 cottagers who were proficient in spinning, uh, weaving and dyeing, um, 
according to her employment records, which she hoped that at any one time this would rescue thousands from destitution by planting in large districts hope and industry in the place of despair and idleness. So approximately 70,000 square feet at the Midway Plaisance. Um, you can see a map of it on the board. Um, was dead, approximately 70,000 square feet at the Midway Plaisance entrance was dedicated to the two Irish villages and their buildings of industry, shops, entertainments and greenery. An exhibition literature claimed that in the Midway, quote, Mankind saw unseen brothers, they came from the nightsome north and the splendid uh, south, from the wasty west and the effete east, bringing their manners, customs, dress, religions, legends, amusements, that we might know them the better. Man, woman and child, and they lent life and colour to the evanescent panorama. We must not forget, however, that in the midst of people so new and strange to us, there were other, others nearer akin. To many Americans, Old Vienna, the German village, and the Irish villages gave information on the customs of their fathers." End quote. So the positionality of the Irish in this 1893 exhibition um, highlights their social cultural location within the political context of the late 19th century um, in the US. The strict social uh, Darwinist logic of the Midway located Ireland within the earlier stages of perceived civilization in the racialized organization of the broader Chicago Fair. It operated in a dual space of inviting wonder and shock towards countries outside of Europe and Britain, but further reaffirming and admiring the ostensible triumphs of white societies. For example, the presence of the Viennese, German and Irish villages close together, in particular was suggestive of an ancestry inclined towards industrial development and offered a template for uh, future progress the perceived lesser industrialized nations such as the Havanese. The Irish villages uh, thereby stood amid the spectacle of a jumble of foreignness that Meg Armstrong has described. And she explains that the aesthetic ideology um, of the Midway portrayed exotic as chaos, as jumble, a sublimely grotesque and bawdy array of colors, sights, scents and sounds. So clearly then on the spectrum of cultures displayed, Ireland represented the apex of civilizational narratives, equal to Germany and Austria, and positioned at the front of the plaisance, the Irish villages depicted the penultimate achievement of human progress before entering the civilized space of the fair's white city. Um, that should all be in quotes as well. Um, so in this kind of presentation, Ireland was on the fringes of white civilization, en route to the industrial excellence that would warrant it a ticket to the main fairground that housed the machinery, electrical, technical and cultural achievements of the US, Britain and the other world powers of the 19th century, away from this um, Midway Plaisance, which is mainly for uh, colonial villages. So Ireland's capacity for industrial civilization was the narrative that Aberdeen and Hart worked within to promote um, in their activism. They championed the potential of the Irish people um, and made it their life's work um, to, according to them, unlock that potential through the development of rural industry for immediate survival um, and then eventually for the good of the country as a whole. On the midway, the Irish performed a particular modernity through industrial labour, engaging in the mechani uh, mechanisms of product and production physically themselves, um, and in part as a response to racialized international concerns of perceived Irish backwardness and idleness. So therefore, a hopeful narrative for future progress and development existed within these reductive stereotypes of Irish labour practices that supposedly led to rural industries um, expiring in the first place. So the solution and, and the kind of um, problem was both aligned with the, the Irish character in this kind of narrative. The corrective to an imagined history of the country's underdevelopment and weakness due to the Irish character was visualised through the literal performance of rural female labour by the exhibited Irish to popular reception. So for Aberdeen and Hart, rural industry would not only keep the Irish from poverty, but would allow them to compete with large scale mechanisation through their unique high quality goods in a growing transatlantic business. For instance, Hart sought to provide a steady outlet for the work of the Irish peasants and thereby secure the livelihoods of poor Irish women. 
the this kind of is reminiscent of the Irish Revival's cultural project, which reinvigorated or invigorated popular Irish economic nationalism in the 19th century. And therefore, Irish American visitors' immediate sensory exposure to rural Ireland and the fairground heightened the valuable opportunity to monetarily capitalize on feelings of um, guilt from migration, as well as exploiting the emotions of loss and pride taken in native Irish goods. So in this context, the visual metaphors of Irish productivity signaled a collective feeling of hope uh, for the future. It was heralded as a final opportunity uh, for the country. The solution seemed obvious and easy even. Thus it made sense for the Irish villages to feature on the midway, uh, for here was the entry point for their future prosperity. And if contemporaries sold enough, uh, visited enough, and they bought enough, Ireland could be as profitable as her neighboring countries. So um, on the screen at the moment, we can see Alice Hart's uh, village. And this was made up of typical Irish residences and was entered through a replica of the St. Lawrence Gate in uh, Drogheda. The scene was quaint, picturesque and uniquely Irish, according to a popular newspaper at the time, with a reproduction of Donegal Castle um, and a tall round tower. There was a series of whitewashed cottages where homespuns were made by hand. Um, and the village had a medieval feel uh, with a castellated gateway complemented by trees and foliage. The sketch reveals the different heights of the various buildings to evoke a sense of the wholesome nature of the displayed um, Irishness as a composite vision of an Irish past. Irish art and industry took centre stage with demonstrations of spinning, weaving, embroidered hangings, coverlets, curtains, lace and hoisery exhibited in the village hall. An Irish history was carefully cultivated with a wishing chair exact, exactly reproduced to scale and measurement from the Giant's Causeway, standing on Irish soil bought from Ireland in crates. <clears throat> Visitors could also witness the dancing of the Irish jig on the village green in an immersive Irish pa paradise. And there were significant efforts made to convince visitors that um, there was actual Irish soil in, in Chicago. Um, and I went through dozens of transcripts in um, various libraries and, and they, they, it's hard to kind of prove whether it was actually um, brought from Ireland, but the, the documentation seems to attest that they wanted it to be. Um, so newspapers and magazines in the US, Britain and Ireland uh, reported positively on the village. So for example, the English Dover Express expounded that it was one of the most quaint and picturesque uh, presentments on the Midway. However, the Plaisance was anything but peaceful and whimsical, being home to dozens of stools, mock villages, pavilions, and a whole host of other entertainment spectacles. So we can perhaps infer that such newspaper reporting responded directly to the needs of an Irish immigrant population in the US to see their homeland as unspoiled and prosperous. According to the Dundee Evening Telegraph, Hearts Village uh, wonderfully exemplified the deafness of hand and artistic ability of Irish women and the Chicago Tribune celebrated the vivacious cosmopolitan medley of the Midway. And the village itself won many awards um, for dyeing, wood carving, jewellery, silversmith's work um, and ironwork respectively. So visiting the Chicago village uh, became a sensible business decision to revive once flourishing rural industries that combined uh, patriotism and profit in a transatlantic forum. And if you move on to um, Aberdeen's village. So, the one before that one. Um, so the Midway's bazaars, cottages and villages uh, complemented one another. And the entrance to Aberdeen's Irish village, which you can see um, on the screen at the moment was a replica of the north doorway to the chapel built by Cormac, the Bishop King of Munster in the 12th century. Um, Aberdeen's village contained a replica of the ruins of Mockross Abbey and several cottages where the inhabitants of this busy little community ply their industries. Visitors could see lace and crochet work, homespuns, hoisery and bog oak carving. They could also observe Celtic jewellery in the making as well as Finnish pieces, replicas of the Tara brooch and various antiquities. The model of the ancient Celtic cross complemented the historic portrayal of the country, reflecting the early civilization um, and art of Ireland. 
So we can see the importance of kind of a white Celtic character within this portrayal. So building on this, um, Aberdeen's village was less explicitly Celtic than Hearts, as she did not object to English, uh, England as much as her peer, but both traded on ideas of a Celtic um, Irish whiteness that was productive and valuable. Um, thereby, the exhibition constituted another compelling battlefield for disputes about Ireland's relationship to England. So public ways and strategically placed yards allowed visitors to circulate freely in Aberdeen's section of the Chicago Fair. Her Irish village replicated Blarney Castle, as we can see, um, which is a gargantuan symbol of recognisable Irishness at the time. And the ground floor plan of her village shows the vast green space in the centre amid numerous buildings. Um, and so visitors were able to congregate in the middle of the village green and sequentially work their way through, observing the various exhibits on show. Here, there were trees to stimulate the effect of a village and shops and strategic positions enabled the purchase of countless souvenirs. Guests were able to uh, kiss the magic stone at Blarney Castle for 10 cents, as well as get a view of all Ireland from the battlements. And Aberdeen's uh, replica signified the gradual consumerization of stereotypical um, Irishness for profit and play. Um, and visitors could therefore wend their way from music to wood carving and even a dairy over a relatively short distance. Personified symbolism of Ireland was a stronghold within the Chicago exhibition and beyond. In the same way um, that Aberdeen would, would wear Irish made clothing and she saw her body as synonymous with the Royal Revival movement, um, they also saw um, Irish women's labour uh, as their bodily action as central to their activism. So Harp uh, notably mused during her tour of Donegal that the people are wild for work um, and these Irish people were pr prominently displayed in the village. So for, uh, for example, an exhibition held at the Royal School of Art Needlework in 1885 Hart not only exhibited several pieces of hand-spun tweeds, uh, hand-knitten hosiery and hand-woven and hand-worked hand handkerchiefs, but further photographs of the workers at these industries were hung about the show. And moreover, in Hart's 1893 village, her colleagues, um, so white Irish women, were dressed in Connemara red petticoats, fishwife skirts and blouses and scarlet cloaks, and they were described as looking very pretty. So these popular demonstrations reveal the valued performance of female labour with beauty and youth uh, closely tied to convincing visitors that such rural industry in Ireland was worth protecting. Significantly, only the colonial villages in the Midway were depicted labouring in contrast to the self-governing countries on show in the main white city, where, which would mainly exhibit so kind of mechanical uh, models and so on. I can have the next slide, please. That's right. <laughs> so Aberdeen held female labour sacred. Um, in, on the board, there's um, a, a photograph of an Irish worker. And this is made clear in the way that she picked um, Irish women to work in the village. So she undertook a tour of industries in Western Ireland in the 1890s to select women to perform in Chicago. And she was accompanied by seven of the Irish Industries Association's committee. She visited Clones, uh, Carrickham Cross, Limerick, Cork, Skibbereen, uh, Ugale, Kinsale, and finally New Ross. And she picked, according to her memoirs, only the fittest Colleens, skilled in their trade and eager to develop, to represent an authentic, profitable island in Chicago. Uh, so interestingly, appraisals of beauty and youth circulated during the selection process, with Ag Aberdeen herself frequently complimenting her bevy of pe pretty, fresh-looking Irish Colleens. And that's her words. Um, so the revival of uh, rural Irish industries then relied on a kind of comely image of Irishness presented as skilled, quaint and inviting, ripe for trade um, and investment. And its success depended on the normative male gaze of the fairgoer. Rural female labour was personified in the village with an opportunity to observe the making of many of the different kinds of lace and crochet work manufactured in Ireland. And so authentic labour, uh, female labour, in this way became financially profitable um, and images of female industry particularly appealed to Irish Americans who were encouraged uh, in the exhibition li literature to think of their past lives in Ireland envisioning, envisioning, envisioning their mothers, grandmothers or great-grandmothers participating in such work. And so a romantic image of an Irish past rooted in the domesticized body of feminized rural industry was thereby cultivated by prompting or perhaps inventing memories or at the very least some kind of nostalgic remembering of an Irishness experienced, heard or read about. 
gendered perceptions of Irish progress were ultimately rooted in traditional rural industry, tethered to the future labouring in the present. And the obvious disconnect of the Irish villages compared with the images of a technological future on display in the White City uh, was negotiated by the two women's at attachment to a rustic island which they could save. And this refusal to let an imagined historic island expire sustained their rural revival project within the wider arts and crafts revival movement at the time. And their ideological understanding of Ireland, um, which championed a dying industry and emulated the tens of colonialism, sought to transform colonised countries from the outside. So from an external perspective of what needs to be done for the good of the country or the good of the people, um, as opposed to attempting to engage with the cycles of industrialised modernity of the broader 19th century. And so for these two women, preserving the rural aesthetics of Ireland uh, for elite consumption, in particular for Aberdeen, became equal to saving Ireland within the well-established hierarchies of colonial rule in the 19th century. In this way, beauty became distinctly profitable within the terms of female employment. Um, and as Aberdeen wrote, our only difficult to the selection of the girls was a gentleman of the party always wished to choose the prettiest without reference to their qualifications um, in connection with their various industries. So clearly working and acting for the good of Ireland was a sensible economic opportunity for many women um, as, as they were employed and they, they had wages. Um, and this uneasy tension problematizes gendered notions of industry. On the one hand, women became saviors at times of disaster, but their crucial labor uh, became redundant during seasons of prosperity in Ireland. And this disjuncture is, is exacerbated by the fact that Aberdeen hired Colleen's based uh, partly on attractiveness, not necessarily skill, as it insidiously suggested that female labour was superfluous to the everyday, everyday kind of um, toil of workplace hardship. And according to Aberdeen's hiring, hiring practices, women only need to be industrious in times of real tragedy or because of aristocratic demand. Um, they were employed at moments of difficulty only to return to the home when the six month exhibition was over or the winter months themselves ended. And in instances where the women were taken from factories um, in Ireland, their new roles required them to perform work on the smaller scale of an exhibition village. A disorientating project of acting one's lived reality in the shadow of their displayed photographs. And so this intimate kind of symbiosis between the exhibited Irish women um, and the Irish land was crucial in convincing visitors that things were in fact exactly like this in Ireland and were worth investing in. It was the case that women worked, um, you know, spinning and, and weaving in these ways. And the interior of the Blarney Castle was living and sleeping rooms for the 105 uh, village workers. The exhibition space uh, epitomised the voyeuristic display of female bodies in an international setting, as visitors could linger, observe, um, interact or converse in English or Irish with the female workers. Uh, tens of thousands of season tickets were sold, and it is interesting to reflect on whether those who repeatedly visited the exhibition had certain favourite exhibits or actors. The women were employed for half a year and it could be that they forged relationships with those who came to visit them as a one-off or periodically. And within the fair, women were consigned to the fictional home uh, for the consumption of the public and particularly aristocratic consumers in Aberdeen's case. So the popularity of the Irish exhibitions in 1893 um, came from the perceived sense of a true Irishness, which is evidenced through the mass consumption of numerous official guides, descriptive catalogues, reports of exhibits and countless maps and information leaflets. The villages further uh, reinforced um, ideas of home rule with their Scottish and English organisers. And for the most part, Irish Americans participated enthusiastically with the perceived authentic island in the fairground, um, whatever the specificities of their political affiliation. Whilst over the sea, the Irish had become city-like and urban in their homeland, rural and cottage-based industries remained the valued if depleting norm. Um, and therefore the exhibition in 1893 was operating within a dual influence um, of aspirational rural revival industry, as well as a lost past for Irish diasporic groups. The Chicago Irish villages visualized and furthered the relationship between home and migration by encouraging Irish Americans to experience their homeland through the exhibits of Ireland um, in 1893. So it became a celebration of Irishness for recent Irish immigrants and American descendants of immigrants. Um, Numerous postcards from the exhibition to family members in Ireland, England, and the US um, were kind of positively appraisal, uh, appraising of, of 
um, and, and to kind of wrap up, the, the politics of a historic island permeated not only the objects on display, but also the ephemera available for purchase. So one could buy souvenirs of bog oak, Irish jewellery and illustrated books, um, which continually evoked kind of this, this notion that there was an Irish connectedness to the land, which was particularly um, Irish. And so if visitors wish to continue the fantasy of Ireland beyond the fairground, a few cents would allow them to carry a bit of old Ireland into the new world. And this transfiguration of a, uh, of a native island onto a portable kind of paraphernalia enabled Irishness to transcend geographical and material boundaries and circulate within the imaginaries uh, and lived spheres of Irish migrants. And these souvenirs in this way allowed the transference of politics to continue through the trajectories of a six month display and its larger dissemination. So overall, Aberdeen's Irish village made a profit of £50,000 um, and I have been unable to discover figures for Hart's sale in 1893, but she um, did sell £6,000 worth of lace at the Edinburgh Exhibition in 1886 alone. Um, and the influence of the Donegal Industrial Fund peaked in the 1880s and 1890s um, and Dun Ema, part of the Celtic revival movement, replaced it in the early 20th century. So in conclusion, uh, Lady Aberdeen and Alice Hart were crucial to the rural revival project um, and were integral in creating transnational conceptions of Irishness under the rubric of benevolent colonialism in the late 19th century. So everything Irish was made available to the visitor from bog or carving, Galway marble carving, wood carving, a dairy, knitting and embroidery, handloom weaving and spinning, um, lace making and Celtic jewellery to create an ethnic Irish American solidarity. The Irish performed a modernity that was achievable, timely and profitable against British criticisms of the Irish as backward, stagnant and at times hopeless. So importantly, the exhibition platform brought these two conflicting uh, positions together and allowed a fictionalised reconciliation to occur. Whatever past stereotypes of the Irish existed, their display of industry and peoples represented the possibility of a hopeful future, irrespective um, of kind of current famine or, or hardship. Um, and as we have seen, the advertising of Ireland tugged on the heartstrings in a clever, kind of profitable way, as visitors could buy trinkets um, or a souvenir and simultaneously feel like they were helping further Irish industry embodied by these exhibited women. And so we can see that Irish identity in 1890s Chicago was profitably aligned along class, race and gendered intersections to popular Irish American appeal. Thank you. Shamima, thank you for, for an absolutely wonderful and fascinating paper um, about these, these rival uh, Irish villages in the Chicago World's Fair of 1893 and the ways in which they represent Ireland. It's absolutely, absolutely a wonderful presentation. Um, so hopefully uh, people can see us uh, now again. Now we've um, um, turned the, the slides off. Sorry for, for any slight glitches with the slides, but I think everyone Everyone was able to see them uh, in the end. So we've now, now got an opportunity uh, for questions, questions and answers. So uh, obviously people uh, in the room, uh, just raise your hands if you want to ask a question. Um, those of you who are online, um, it, there's a little um, uh, icon on your screen on Teams with a hand. If you click on that and then click on the hand icon, that will just indicate that you want to ask uh, ask a question. So, and then we'll ask you to unmute yourselves. So you must start. Yeah, go ahead. So thanks for that. Um, <coughs> that's all the time, I mean, uh, very much looking forward to your book as well. So um, I suppose some of the buzzwords you had there in terms of female labor and the kind of romanticization of an Irish past. Um, just so curious, I know Frederick Douglass and a few other kind of leaders of the black community actually came out and about a pamphlet kind of protesting the, the exhibition. Then I think even Jemima got her start uh, at the book fair as well. Um, Nancy Green, I think, was in uh, So I'm just wondering, was there any resentment of kind of that there is not only, I suppose, they applied for kind of an African American uh, exhibition and they're denied this, and then you have two Irish exhibitions, as, as Peter says. Is there any kind of protest of that or any engagement? Um, and then just on a, on a kind of the side, so kind of shoehorn another question in. Was there any kind of anti-Irish was discrimination at the close of the fair? This, did uh, Patrick Pendergrass assassinated the mayor of Chicago? 
right at the tail end of the exhibition. So did that kind of scupper their efforts at all to kind of pre present this romanticized rural Ireland uh, that he was, you know, from Inishbop and, and you know, this rural Irish man that assassinates the mayor? Thank you for, for those questions. On the, the first one, in terms of kind of black American participation, there were, I think Nathan Carden has written on um, the Nashville exposition, ex exposition um, whereby um, the, the similar kind of tropes that we have with Ireland in terms of rural industry and, and labor were again um, put on display, but for, um, for kind of black bodies and in relation to kind of mining and industry in that way. Um, and I'm not sure as in if for the Chicago exhibition there was uh, any kind of tension with the, the fact that there were the two Irish villages. There was an instance of um, protest during the close of the fair when um, Aberdeen essentially displayed a, 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 the Union Jack flag um, to celebrate her, uh, the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, um, traveling to see the Chicago fair and that was torn down by um, angry, angry men um, and, and various kind of newspaper reports. So, you know, there's the, what sometimes you read it's hundreds, other times you read it's thousands of men basically stormed the, the fair itself and tore down um, the, the, the Union Jack. Um, Aberdeen herself tries to play down that, that incident, um, as you'd be unsurprised, but it did travel news of that to kind of the San Francisco newspapers. Um, and in and, and New York and, and so on. So there was definitely kind of um, anti-British sentiment um, and kind of uh, anti-home rule sentiment as much as, uh, much as anything else. Okay, thanks. I'm going to come to Sean in just a minute, but I'm maybe alternate between uh, online and in the room. So Guy, uh, I think your hand was up first. Over to you. Uh, so Mario, thank you very much for that. I, I enjoyed it a lot. Um, I, I'm just thinking, um, uh, you showed us the two exhibitions in Chicago in the uh, in the Midway exhibition, but of course, five years earlier at London, as you know very well, there was the exhibition in Olympia where the two of them cooperated, right? That was before the, the split, before the rift, and there was one combined. Um, and again, the same kind of assemblage uh, was already there, and it was like, you know, in Bally McClinton and other places, the same kind of assemblage of kind of kitsch and stereotypes which form a supposedly authentic village, which has... Uh, various political implications. What I'm wondering, though, is in the difference of the five years, apart from the split, what is the difference of this exhibition migrating to the States as opposed to the one in London? Um, you know, for an outsider, they look quite similar, but surely the reception and interactions there would have worked differently, and they would have taken that into account in some way in the move to, to, to North America. Absolutely. There was a, a very kind of clear conscious um, decision made by um, Aberdeen Hart to appeal to Irish migrants in the US. And, and they kind of used um, images and uh, kind of motifs of, of islands that were most kind of reminiscent of, of, an, of a 19th century um, kind of country that they left behind, whereas the, the ones um, the, the, particularly the one, the Bally McClinton village in the Franco-British exhibition of 1908, very much um, situated in Irish industrial kind of modernity within the rural, rural kind of um, presentment of Ireland. So it was the sense that there were kind of two things happening at the same time, um, whereby the, the migrants in essence um, would have wanted to see a kind of unspoiled homeland that, that wasn't kind of at risk of um, industrialization or modernization as, as England had been in terms of kind of uh, the, the, the destruction of the countryside and, and rurality in that way. And so the, the ones in the US were very distinctly kind of um, geared towards this protective, um, incredibly kind of fictionalized stance of, of uh, complete isolation and um, disabandonment from modernity, whereas the ones, particularly in London, had to um, marry the, the sense of an Irish rurality with um, also championing a narrative of kind of Irish um, urban kind of excellence and in order to compete with the kind of uh, demands of, of modernization. In terms of, of the two women themselves, there, I, I read a particularly kind of interesting quote from Hart where she says that she was, she's been treated better in the pigsty than she has in the kind of elite boardrooms of um, Aberdeen circles. So we get the sense that there were many tensions there um, and it's quite difficult to kind of find anything more concrete 
because I think Hart's aware of her, her position within kind of middle class England in terms of she wants her her, her shop to kind of make sales um, and, and Aberdeen's kind of politics are, are on a more kind of aristocratic scale. So uh, on an aristocratic scale. So the one can only assume that at, at one point it became untenable for the two of them to kind of work together for these the exacerbation of these these particular reasons. But again, the kind of the the insistence that the soil imported um, to be displayed at the Chicago Fair was from Ireland was a very uniquely American thing that, of course, did not happen in in, in London or Ireland itself. Okay, uh, thanks, Guy. Uh, let's go to Sean in the room. Uh, you, you did an excellent job there in teasing out all the um, assumptions and the ideological messages you know, built into the, the villages. But I'm not entirely clear on what Aberdeen and Hart actually consciously thought they were trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. I mean, how far were they trying to drum up investment for Ireland? Mm -hmm. How far were they trying to uh, push Irish goods and bring them to the attention of American retailers. And now in your answer to Guy just mm -hmm. now, you talked about them reaching out to American immigrants, to Irish immigrants in America. What do they want those Irish immigrants actually to do for them? Yeah, so it's, it's a kind of a multi-layered um, set of aspirations, I think, on, on the two of them. I think they should be dealt with kind of um, distinctly. So for her, her in, in much of her writing, you get the sense that she uh, feels a, a real sense of empathy for the poor, specifically in Donegal, um, and and her kind of immediate goal is to um, to prevent kind of further death and starvation amongst this particular group in in Ireland, and the way she's envisaged that happening is to provide immediate employment, um, and that the long term strategy is that the production of these goods um, would then have an international market that could compete with mechanisation um, that would sustain rural industry in that country. Um, Aberdeen is, is is similar and dissimilar in, in many ways, whereby her kind of um, ambitions seem to kind of <clears throat> more so mirror a kind of capitalist system of, of commerce, whereby it was more about kind of the advertisement of Irish goods, the creation of a transatlantic uh, business and the, the drumming up of um, Kind of uh, sentiment for Irish uh, rural-made products, which linked with the Celtic revival movement at the time in in the U.S. and and then they're encouraging um, Irish migrants in in the U.S. to to buy these goods, but also to make it fashionable. I mean, she was ultimately an aristocratic lady who threw many parties, um, and there's there's various pictures of her having dressed her entire family in Irish-made tweed and kind of Irish linen, and it. For her, it was as much a spectacle as anything else. And I think, again, that's part of the kind of dissolution with her, which is the kind of um, this bodily personification of Irishness, despite um, not being Irish themselves. OK, let's go to Matthew on the call. Yeah, thanks so much and a wonderful talk. Really appreciate it. Um, my question is um, regards the Irish language. In, in early May in the New York Irish American, there was a uh, a really lengthy rather scathing letter in the Irish language uh, criticizing the the Irish in Chicago for not incorporating Irish in the World's Fair like uh, their uh, Welsh counterparts had done. So I wonder, have you uncovered any research from either Aberdeen or Hart into whether they worked with the, the Gaelic Society in Chicago with to potentially incorporate the Irish language or was that not even on their radar in the slightest, which is what the New York uh, Irish Society seemed to be implying? <laughs> So from from lack of evidence, um, I think I can maybe speculate that the latter might be uh, true. But in later fairs, there was a, a, a particularly this the, the Franco British Exhibition of 1908. There was a real sense um, and a real desire to um, present an authentic Irishness as far as possible. So there was an effort in those exhibition in that ex exhibition in particular to hire um, women. And I think the advertisement said um, women with good Irish accents. Um, so there was a there was a kind of concerted effort there. But again, um, some visitors, particularly Irish visitors, were quite critical, and they insisted that these women weren't actually Irish because they had terrible Irish accents. So then that makes one perhaps, as a, as a reader, you assume that maybe they weren't all Irish women. Maybe there's some of them were English women pretending to to, to be Irish. But um, as I say, I, I don't have evidence of that in Aberdeen and Hart's case, but. In later exhibition, that was definitely kind of uh, a, a championed characteristic in these in these women that they were hiring. Okay, we have a question at the back here in the room. Hi, uh, 
uh, <clears throat> and you sort of hinted at this earlier in the school, feeling this nationalist uh, dispute and how that's represented and um, how it breaks out. Um, more generally, how is the global paradigm perhaps in, in Irish trade terms, especially in secret communists in the middle of Ireland politically? Uh, so in the 1893 fair, I, there was an effort to, I mean, with, with many of these fairs, the ultimate purpose is, is trade and kind of profit. And uh, there's a, a degree to which the organisers um, desire them to be apolitical spaces. But you know, as earlier mentioned, with the kind of tearing down of the flag, they're of course not, you know, any time kind of people are involved, politics are involved. Um, with the Ballin McClinton village, the organisers of that, um, the Irish kind of pavilion, were two Protestant unionist businessmen who owned a soap factory in Donegal County, Tyrone, and they were um, very anti-home rule. Um, they both actually, the two brothers signed the Ulster Covenant, um, and they were very explicit in their vision of Ireland on the fairground um, as being entirely uh, Responsible uh, to the relationship with with, it, the, with with England, and so they very much saw the fair as an opportunity to stress how important trade was with the with the union and how important that was for their salt factory. So we, um, but they are a very kind of rare case of uh, being quite explicit in their home rule propaganda, anti home rule propaganda, um, as it were, in terms of kind of being uh, pro pro unionist. But I, there was an effort. To, to be non-partisan, I think just because of the recognition of the, the variety of, of visitors and the ultimate kind of goal being um, trade as opposed to being political kind of an end goal politically. Okay, thanks for your question, Jamie. Let's go back to the call. We have Sandra uh, who's waiting to ask a question. Yes, thank you for your excellent paper. I was really interested in the tensions with the desire to save Ireland from colonialism through this benevolent colonialism, as you referred to it and how it produced these racialized stereotypes. And I was reminded of Homi K. Baba's account of the fixity of the stereotype and location of culture. But I was wondering if you could say more about these racialized stereotypes or about the theoretical approaches that you're taking. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, the, the kind of the, the historical thinking behind that comes from as I'm sure everyone in this in this room is, is aware, the kind of the, the popular British discourse in the in the post famine period and in the in the later kind of um, movement for Irish um, independence, whereby uh, certain kind of um, I didn't say politicians, it was just kind of general kind of uh, public feeling was that attempted to equate um, Irishness as being incompatible to independence so these these individuals could not possibly um, rule themselves and, and some of the kind of stereotypes that that were used um, particularly seen in kind of punch magazine and and the kind of the representation of um, kind of desires or ambitions for Irish independence being kind of overtly masculinized and simulized in popular discourse so this said this sense that you know Irish um, men in particular who were, who were pushing this kind of um, uh, movement themselves were kind of prone to idleness and, and, and drunkenness and, and couldn't possibly um, rule themselves and in essence um, I kind of interpret these fairs as, as, as trying to counter that by um, the fact that they mainly present women and so these women were kind of fair and beautiful and and, and youthful and were presenting this image of Ireland as being in a healthy, safe, inviting and clean. Um, there were hardly any men in these fairs um, and the only men that did exist were, were young boys. Um, and it's no surprise that that typically occurred in um, places like London, whereby, of course, there was this kind of real um, fear, fictitious or otherwise, of, of Irish male um, uh, violence. and. Within the, the kind of the space of the, the midway plaisance in particular, um, and you, you see this in later fairs, Ireland was typically represented in the, the colonial kind of um, section of, of the fairground itself. So, for instance, in 1908 one, it was next to the Somali and the Senegalese villages, but always with with difference ascribed. And Annie Coombs talks about it quite uh, quite a bit, and and McClintock as well, which is that um, in the guidebooks, the Irish were accorded with history, tradition and religion and, and kind of culture, whereas the Somali and Senegalese villages were only presented as kind of rural labour. 
And so even though the kind of the space and the positionality of the fairground was similar, distinctions are constantly maintained, uh, which is why I can kind of confidently infer that the, the positioning of Ireland next to Germany and Austria was not kind of insignificant. It was designed to present this kind of um, broader spectrum of um, perceived humanity according to these 19th century uh, racialized stereotypes. Okay, Sandra, thank you for your question. Yeah, yeah, Lucy? Thank you so much. I really enjoyed talking to you. Um, I'm just interested in how uh, feminism is presented in the book. Um, and I'm just wondering if this was um, significant to the Ireland, or this was common within the exhibition, um, were other uh, national imagining how you were organized and the goods that they provided with these various pieces were they also inherently feminine um, or just Ireland? That's a that's a great question and one that um on the on the face of it it was very idiosyncratic to Ireland in terms of this kind of um equation of rurality with femininity and partly um in response to the, the previous question whereby I think it mediates the um the idea of kind of this this uh, perceived idea of kind of male violence, but also um, it correlates directly with who was producing this kind of rural labour in terms of spinning, weaving, um, and and sewing. They did predominantly tend to be um, female industries. In other colonial villages, what you see far more than just women is family units. So particularly in um, kind of displays of, of Native Americans, you, you know, or the, even the Somali and Senegalese village, it'll always be, you know, a husband and a wife and, and their and their children or their kind of um, tribal leaders and so on. And so there was this effort to to kind of create a, a community um, of that country. Whereas um, in, I, in, in the kind of uh, the presentation of Irish villages that, that I've, I've researched from, from the 1850s onwards, um, when the focus is away from, from industry and modernity and mechanization, uh, which are typically kind of um, displayed by by models and explained um, by a mixture of kind of male and, and female um, interpreters. There, there's a an effort to have an exclusively female labour force, um, and and partly I I think coincides with the with the practical makeup of that specific area of rural industry, but also um, for the purposes of trade and investment. This is was a very appealing, attractive image of Ireland that also had later kind of uh, consequences for the Irish tourism industry. You know, there was a real sense that this was one of the kind of uh, unique um, and, and profitable things about Ireland was the hospitality of particularly Irish women and, and, and their kind of authenticity within that landscape. Okay, good, thank you, Lucy. So maybe I can ask a, a question, Shamima. So um, I suppose one thing I'm interested in is um, what the kind of commissioning process is for exhibits at the uh, at the World's Fair. I mean, is there a call for um, proposals uh, made, and if so, by whom and through what media? Uh, through what medium? Um, who decides? If you've got um, a number of different um, proposals coming in, who decides which? is to be accepted and which is to be declined. Uh, presumably there are declined ones, entrepreneurs who aren't success successful in their bids. Who decides on the location and the layout uh, of the bids? Presumably that's not the uh, exhibitors themselves, but the organizing committee. Um, uh, so I suppose I'm, I'm interested in not just the, the um, you know, cultural and commercial mm -hmm. uh, entrepreneurs, but on if you like the organizing structure. Of the of the exhibit, can you tell us a bit more about that? So the answer to that is incredibly and deeply bureaucratic, um, and I have I have spent several hours, I was several hundreds of hours in the archives, going through various uh, committee reports, and in essence, it um, there was an international bureau of exhibition expositions that was um, based in in Paris in in the early twentieth century, but previous to that, um, countries would would bid for uh, a fair and they would invite other countries um, to display um, their industries, their, their goods, their, their people within that space. And um, each exhibition um, would have its own committee and this committee would, made up, would be made up of about say 25 other committees and they typically tend to be divided into industry, uh, technology, um, arts and, and culture and there's a fourth one, industry. For basically big groupings of um, the the 
the thematic objects of fairs. And within those committees, there tend to be about 20 to 30 entirely, mainly men. Um, and they tend to be businessmen or entrepreneurs, sometimes politicians, sometimes members of parliament. Um, with the case of the kind of um, the ones held in in Britain, there was uh, quite often there was funding from um, from from the, from the monarchy. There was kind of government funding. There was also um, Albert was involved in in quite a few of them, um, and it was yet yeah, incredibly deeply tedious and bureaucratic. And and the, these committees they sat um, almost every week for several weeks uh, before um, the, the the affair was accepted. And then they would go through all of the kind of uh, appeals for uh, display, whether it be a pavilion or a stall, and they'd be advertised through newspapers um, mainly. Um, and again, if say for instance um, a country was successful, they would then uh, encourage their um, the various traders or uh, manufacturers to uh, petition to display. Um, and it, it was an incredibly long, long process. So most of these fairs would take between one to three years to organise. And then you can imagine that they were only on display for six months at a time. So it was a huge financial expenditure, a huge kind of emotional, uh, a, labor, uh, a huge physical um, expenditure as well. But again, if we can imagine, you know, these were the, the prime sources of, of trade at the time. This was a, a hugely kind of crucial endeavour. Um, Ireland itself, particularly in later fairs, becomes uh, interesting with, with De, De Valera. Um, he was notorious for refusing to um, exhibit Ireland at these international expositions, um, primarily because he uh, resented and rejected this kind of rural vision of Ireland that was portrayed in the early 20th mm. century. And so this kind of um, uh, the Irish Free State and, and the, the kind of uh, later Republic would not um, ascribe to these reductive ten tendencies of the country, um, even though the counters of those arguments were, well, it's good for tourism. Um, De Valera was absolutely insistent that Ireland would not display itself. It did uh, in, in 1938 in the British Empire exhibition in Glasgow and then in the New York World's Fair of 1939, but they were very different. There was no rural Irish village. There were displays of the Shannon electric, hydroelectric scheme, Shannon Airport. Um, there were huge murals of kind of Ireland's modernity and modernisation, which was entirely divergent to you know, these quaint yeah. images of, of Celtic hospitality that we've seen. It's a, okay, I just have to follow up on, sorry, and then I'll come, I'll come back to Liam. It, it seems rather odd, you know, if, if the call is going out um, uh, that if you know, the, 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 the best financed and the best organised and the most, in many ways, most aggressive forms of industrial capitalism in Ireland, that is Belfast industry, both textiles and, and engineering and shipbuilding, don't put forward a proposal to have that form of modernity represented. In Chicago in 1893, and, and obviously when they do at other, they do. Well, first what yeah. you just wanted to just mention. So, yeah. did, you know, it, it, I mean, you can see why Lady Aberdeen would, uh, you know, a former vice vice ran very well connected, would have her foot in the door. But Alice Hart perhaps is, is a more interesting one because she doesn't represent mm. organised capital. It's a you know, principally a philanthropic exercise, isn't it? So, how, how does she manage to 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 in a sense? get to fly the flag of Ireland in 1893 when other interests that you, you would have anticipated being more powerful mm. don't don't appear. So the interesting case with, with, with Belfast is they do, um, Northern Ireland itself does uh, feature in these later exhibitions but always as part of England and the, the UK. So in whatever pavilion would be created for um, the UK, there'd always be a section on um, you know, uh, Irish linen or, or ship shipbuilding. And um, this continues right up until the kind of pre post-war um, period. With Hart, her the, the zeal with which she went about her, her work was was quite powerful at the mm -hmm. time. She was very um, kind of present in um, these types of circles because of her charitable endeavours. So she would um, routinely almost daily give lectures on um, kind of the English, um, the murderous nature of the English relationship with, with Ireland and she was quite kind of uh, passionate and, and very evocative and I and also her kind of her travelling back and forth between the two countries. Um, her husband had a, a, a position, a kind of high-ranking high position um, and ultimately, I think because she established the, the shop in, in, in London and she did establish, um, I, don't know, I don't think as many net, uh, technical schools in Donegal as she she wanted, but there was a kind of a, a base for her to be considered a legitimate kind of um, addition to what Aberdeen was portraying, because ultimately you know, this would be more money um, and for, for, for the kind of um, the profits of, of consumption that was ultimately the goal, the goal of these fairs. Yeah. Okay, thank you.
Thanks. Oh, Liam, you want to come? Yeah, thanks. Actually, I was <coughs> wondering what exactly the same point is future. Um, you know, also being the industrial heartland of Ireland, you might expect more from it. As uh, kind of the dog that didn't bark, although I can see reasons why its role should be obscured. At a different point, um, a few weeks ago, the Economist magazine spoke about the extraordinary soft power of Ireland internationally. And I just wonder if this is one moment in the gradual rise of Irish soft power in, in North America. Absolutely. I mean, that's the, one of the major arguments of my monograph is essentially that these um, exhibitions were the earliest forms of um, kind of stereotype, stereotypical representations of, of Ireland that become the, the forefront um, of kind of commerce and, and, and trade in terms of the, the images that we see here of kind of Irish women tied to, to the land um, are, are deployed time and time again. Um, in, in various kind of um, brands. So that the brothers that I mentioned earlier, they sold soap, but on the packaging of the soap was um, Irish women wearing red and green cloaks. Um, and so there was this really distinctive kind of um, ability to, to see Irishness through um, things like kind of rurality or um, like the Connemara uh, cloaks, or um, there was efforts in the 1893 fair, which I didn't mention, um, there was um, an Irish restaurant which sold uh, solder bread. Uh, there was also kind of Irish singing. So there was a real kind of um, commercialization of kind of Irishness in a way that would make it kind of, in a way that made it identifiable and was later deployed in uh, not only kind of later exhibitions, but uh, was kind of capitalized on by the Irish Tourism Board when it was founded in the 1930s. There's this kind of sense of um, that the rehashing of these, these tropes were, um, as you put it, kind of this this soft power that 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 had transatlantic um, merit, and and particularly when when considering um, an Irish migrant community in the U.S. who were perhaps desperate to see these images of their homeland evoked time and time again in a way that that was unchanged and was unspoiled and and was was um, was surviving and was able to to, to be invested in further. Can you saw the question actually just. How did these stack up with the 1876 Philadelphia, the Philadelphia Fair in 76? Mm -hmm. And then was there an Irish exhibition there? Or they... I don't know. Oh, I'm just curious. Yeah. Just if they... I'm not sure. It's like the Canadians that make these people the mm -hmm. as well. Like that's the same. Mm -hmm. yeah. They brought in the like, pipes from 1798. And... Mm -hmm. Thank you for that <laughs> Okay, um, let's see. Do we have any other questions from people uh, online? Um, just press the button if you want to ask anything. Anyone in the room has had an opportunity, wants to ask something? No? Okay, so um, I think we've um, uh, we, we've had a great uh, presentation, a really interesting uh, question and answer session as well. So um, on behalf of everyone here and, uh, and out there, I'd like to thank uh, Shamima again uh, for coming over from London and presenting her research. Um, the book is coming out next year, Shamima, is that right? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, something to look forward to. Um, uh, if this has whetted your appetite, uh, which it certainly has mine. Um, so that, that'll be out next year. Um, so can we finish uh, perhaps just in the traditional fashion um, by giving Shamima a round of applause. Those of you online, um, just, you can unmute yourselves and do it as well. Or you can put guys in the camera.